Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Nikos Tsafos, and I'm the James Schlesinger Chair for Energy and Geopolitics here at the Center for Strategic International Studies. And I'm so delighted to welcome today to CSIS the European Commissioner for Energy, Kadri Simpson. Uh, Commissioner Simpson is here for the meeting of the US-EU Energy Council uh, that happened yesterday with Secretaries Blinken, Granholm, and the EU High Representative, Joseph Borrell. So we're here to talk about that, but also, of course, so many things happening on the topic of European energy, both in terms of the current moment, but also where Europe wants to go. So it's great to have you here at CSIS. Um, one piece of logistics before we start our conversation, if you're watching this online, there's a button for you to submit a question. Please do so. My colleagues will get those questions to me as we go along. I will do my best to integrate them into the conversation. Commissioner Simpson, um, you're here for the US-EU Energy Council. Uh, some of us may have read the statement that came out yesterday. One thing I noticed, it was a very long statement. Uh, so much to talk about, uh, covered a lot of ground. What are your main takeaways from that conversation? Where are the sort of highlight areas of collaboration? What was on the agenda? What did you take out away from that conversation? Good morning. And uh, thank you for having me here. Well, indeed, this statement was long because, well, we had uh, quite a time to, well, prepare that. It was first Energy Council, EU-US Energy Council, after three and a half years. So the previous one um, happened uh, in the summer 2018. And, uh, and right now, the timing was excellent. Um, but um, mainly, we wanted to uh, discuss our cooperation we share the same values and uh, we, s we share the same ambition to become climate neutral by 2050. So to achieve that, we need to well, share best practices. And uh, uh, this was also the uh, reason why some of our discussions were dedicated to innovation and new technologies. We discussed how we can uh, create a uh, global hydrogen market we discussed some new uh, technolo technological solutions that will help us on our path towards climate neutrality. But uh, because uh, this uh, Energy Council is, uh, is um, not dedicated only to the well, uh, energy-related topics, uh, there, there is me and my counterpart Jennifer Granholm, but also our top uh, foreign affairs uh, uh, officials, then we had to discuss energy security the current uh, global tensions uh, that are threatening uh, not only Europe, but also our neighborhood. And, uh, and we also um, um, discussed our joint effort to support Ukraine uh, for Europe. Ukraine has been a very um, trusted transit country. Um, just a couple of years ago, we um, helped Ukraine to negotiate the next five-year term transit contract uh, with Gazprom, but, uh, but now for, for us the high priority is to synchronize uh, Ukraine's electricity grid to European grid. So all these work streams uh, were on our table and what we agreed was that uh, next year the next Energy Council will take place so we don't uh, skip uh, several years uh, anymore. And, and of course uh, we will follow up this work uh, at the high level technical uh, meetings. Fantastic. No, and I really appreciated the, the amount of real estate you gave to the synchronization of the grids and to European integration with both the Baltics, Ukraine, and the Western Balkans. I think that's, that's great. And, and if we have time, I want to come back to some of the things you put on the table. But let me turn to the question that I think is on everyone's mind for the moment. Uh, we've seen a period of very high energy and particularly gas prices in Europe over the last six, seven months. Um, maybe we can start at what do you think is happening? What's your diagnosis? How do you read the kind of events that we're observing? And also 
the European Union has put some things on the table late last year to try to address the current moment. Walk us through a little bit. First, w when you see what's happening, what do you think is causing it? And what is the Commission doing sort of in the immediate, not the long-term transformation, but the immediate uh, action that you can take? Well, that's true that we are witnessing extremely high energy prices right now. And this is uh, um, creating uh, problems for our industry and households. Uh, it started last autumn. And uh, the main driver then was uh, the uh, fast um, recovery of world economy. So uh, the driver was not EU market, but uh, mainly um, Asia's demand and uh, their willingness to pay significantly higher margins uh, for LNG cargoes than uh, European uh, traders were willing to pay. Um, as a result, now the uh, high energy prices are a, a matter of fact uh, in place all across the globe. Um, and, uh, and for us, um, the heating season is um, peak season when we do consume gas, natural gas. So, uh, so we had to uh, um, adopt and we proposed, uh, we proposed several measures um, to help our, our consumers and our households. Um, why the uh, prices remain so high? Um, there are also geopolitical tensions uh, that uh, create some anxiety in our uh, gas market. We have seen that um, since the end of last year, Russian shipments, pipeline gas shipments, have been significantly um, um, decreased. And we have to replace it with, uh, with LNG uh, deliveries. We have done so and uh, in January the LNG shipments were at record high level for Europe. And of course, um, reactions towards these market signals have been also um, from uh, consumption side. Uh, the um, power generation um, has, uh, well, has uh, replaced some of the natural gas with other alternatives. So, um, what is good, good is that, uh, that um, in December last year, in Europe, uh, the renewables um, outcompeted fossil fuels. And in the regions where we do have more renewables in our energy mix, consumers can benefit and they, uh, they will have lower, lower energy prices. Uh, but um, but uh, there are, well, three concerns. One of those is affordability. We can lower uh, taxes. We can um, uh, support consumers with direct um, um, support schemes. Uh, then there is a security of supply concern. And this was also one of the topics that we discussed with our U.S. counterparts. Can I, you know, there's, when I, when I look at what's happening in Europe, obviously there's a need to as you say, relieve the pressure from industries and from households to deal with the current crisis. But in some ways, what happened over the last six, seven months also exposed, I think, some maybe more structural weaknesses in the European market. I mean, you know, we, we had a, you know, gas problem like not fill storage and it, and it wasn't clear that the EU regulatory system could do much about it besides observe that storage was not being filled. Uh, and we saw maybe other weaknesses as well. You know, how do you think about addressing some of those kind of structural challenges? Again, not, not in the, we'll talk about, you know, the EU framework about the gas markets. We'll talk about further down, but more in the sort of two to five year. Like, do you see any kind of important interventions that at some point the commission talked about? I won't call it, in, in, I think it was called investigation or something into the market mechanisms. Walk us through some of those components that might sort of relieve the pressure from the type of weaknesses that we saw these past seven, eight months? Yes, uh, well, indeed, uh, what we see right now, this is a uh, gas market crisis. This is not a result of our green transition. On the contrary, we see that uh, green transition is a part of our, uh, is a solution for our problems. Right now, um, 
despite all the efforts to diversify our energy mix, to diversify supply routes for natural gas and suppliers, we are still very dependent on imported fossil fuels. So 90% of uh, uh, fossil gas that we consume is imported, um, even worse, on uh, uh, crude oil um, uh, um, consumption. And, um, and at the same time, uh, compared to the previous crisis that we had uh, more than a decade ago, we have invested a lot um, into the, but, uh, into the um, uh, um, infrastructure. All across Europe we do have now LNG terminals, uh, which is a commodity that you can trade freely and uh, gives us some flexibility. It has helped already us uh, to compensate the a decrease of uh, pipeline flows from uh, from major supplier from Russia, and uh, and we have also invested a lot into the interconnectors between our member states. So, preparing now our contingency plans and preparing um, um, different scenarios, if there will be a, a real disruption, partial or full disruption from a pipeline flows from Russia, we have identified uh, alternative uh, routes. And, uh, and of course, uh, there is a, a possibility to introduce reverse flows. For example, this is already ongoing since 21st of December, when flows uh, from Yamal pipeline, that means Russia, uh, Russia's deliveries uh, through Belarus to Poland, have been stopped. And now uh, Poland is, uh, is um, uh, served uh, via Germany using reverse flows. So uh, this is a good example how you shouldn't waste good crisis. And, uh, and Europe has, uh, ha has um, um, acted since the previous crisis. So um, now there is a question that uh, are there sufficient um, alternative uh, supplies available um, at the global scale? So uh, this is what I am doing. I'm following our president's uh, calls. So uh, already last autumn, we reached out to Qatar and Norway, who both are good and uh, um, reliable partners. Uh, I just came here from Azerbaijan because this is the year when Azeri pipeline uh, will reach the maximum capacity. And, uh, and of course, the United States has helped us a lot since December and January. We have received lots of LNG cargos. Uh, that helped us to replace uh, um, the missing uh, pipeline volumes. Absolutely, US LNG being the top supplier into Europe in January, uh, quite, a, quite a turn. And I, and I also appreciate what you said. I think sometimes in Washington there's a sense that the crisis happened in 2006 and 2009 and Europe did nothing. So I really appreciate you articulating all the different ways in which European energy security has been enhanced. Um, let me turn a little bit more into the future and the transformation of the European energy system. Uh, in December, uh, the Commission put out a, a sort of new framework for methane, for gas markets, for hydrogen. It was, uh, you know, the, the EU Green Deal is a marathon, right? So it's never, I'm never quite sure what milestone we're at. Uh, a new thing comes and then a new thing comes. But, but walk us through what happened in, in, in December. What, what did that framework entail? How important is it? what was in it and what you're hoping to accomplish with that? Well, we call this December package as a second part of Fit for 55 package. So, so uh, my colleagues are telling me that uh, uh, this was the biggest uh, package of proposals that Commission has ever proposed. These um, uh, uh, legislative proposals are very interlinked and, and there will be a great challenge um, now ahead of us to negotiate with uh, all our member states and European Parliament. Uh, there will be different formations of ministers, different formations from um, uh, committees of the Parliament um, well, uh, negotiating um, um, these pieces. When in the summer last year we proposed uh, to raise our targets for renewables and energy efficiency, so that, uh, that it will be possible to cut our greenhouse gas emissions by at least 55 percent uh, by 2030. Then now we addressed uh, um, maybe um, more complicated uh, uh, sectors. Um, gas is definitely one of those. 
We know that uh, we will need natural gas as uh, a fuel during our, our transition period, but we have to start decarbonizing our gas uh, um, market. And that's why one of the main um, 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 aims of this decarbonized gas market and hydrogen proposal was to uh, um, open the access for clean gases, but also uh, to, um, to create a framework for hydrogen, because uh, we don't have EU-wide hydrogen market right now, but we hope that by 2030 we will have a well-functioning hydrogen market. And then on top of that, we strengthened the security of supply aspect because, uh, um, because of current tensions. And then, uh, uh, then as a first uh, region, um, um, we uh, followed up the global methane pledge. Um, I think that that was a very good uh, example how European Union and United States can work together um, how we um, attracted so many uh, partners to become signature, signatories of glo Global Methane Pledge. And, um, well, you can lead by example. So um, we, will, uh, we will address with our legislation EU uh, uh, methane, uh, methane um, emissions in the coal sector and also gas and oil sector. And then uh, we will promote um, the global um, um, approach under the International uh, Methane Emissions Observatory. And the third uh, part of this December package was dedicated to our buildings. Because what we see right now, uh, well, 22% of our gas consumption goes to heating. So, if you insulate your houses, you can also cut uh, dependency that you do have uh, uh, in this in this sector. No, thank you. As you said, it's a it's a big package. You, you put a couple of things on the table that, if we have time, I'd like to go back to both the the methane and the and the clean gases and hydrogen. But let me take you to another corner of the conversation for a second, and that is sort of finance and investment. Um, and I would like to hear your thoughts on both the mobilization of finance within the European Union, um, but also, you know, COP26 wasn't that long ago, <laughs> uh, even though we've been sort of consumed by this current crisis. Um, the, the question of how do we make enough capital available to emerging economies to meet their commitments uh, continues to come up. So maybe we can walk us through both the sort of intra-European conversation as well as the sort of European contribution to this global target that we have to increase the flow of capital to countries that need it to meet their goals. Well, we really uh, think that this is uh, important to, uh, to help emerging economies um, to decarbonize their um, well, energy portfolio too. And uh, in this regard, Europe has been a major contributor to, uh, uh, to global financing. Well, um, last uh, September, before the COP, our President Ursula von der Leyen announced that on top of already, um, um, well, um, already uh, 23 billion euros that we have provided for global financing, we will add uh, four more billions so that it will um, trigger the action from other, uh, other um, um, partners. So um, this is uh, a priority for us, even at the moment where, uh, where energy prices are uh, creating a trouble back home. For example, this afternoon I'm leaving from here to uh, Dakar. Uh, Senegal uh, took over the African Union's presidency and we will have a, a visit together with our president Ursula von der Leyen there because uh, well, we have to promote, uh, promote um, sustainable development uh, also in Africa. Um, coming back to home or well, uh, what we can do in the European Union, well, we 
we do have um, a clear understanding that uh, we can support uh, some uh, projects with uh, our public financing. And we just agreed with the long-term um, funding uh, at the EU level and, uh, and then to, um, to support um, the recovery, we also added uh, recovery funds. So member states have to dedicate 37% um, of their expenditure to the climate-related uh, projects. Um, there are different uh, uh, work streams, well, renovation is one of those, but of course lots of uh, renewable projects uh, starting from offshore wind and, uh, and solar and, uh, and, um, and of course uh, hydrogen, which is uh, a, uh, a new attractive uh, um, mm, fuel for, for uh, industry and, uh, and transport. But we need private investments to achieve our targets. So uh, in this regard, um, the taxonomy, well, EU taxonomy uh, should help us to guide uh, private investors uh, towards investments that we regard um, as sustainable. Uh, there was first um, act um, on, on taxonomy last year that covered all the renewables. And now, uh, um, just a week ago, we proposed um, another delegated act that covers um, the fuels that we will need during transition. Among them, there is natural gas and uh, investments into, into nuclear. Uh, sometimes this town follows the conversation of the European taxonomy like it's a soap opera. You know, we're, we're waiting for the new episode. Um, you mentioned the, the new delegated act. Uh, can I maybe get you to say a few more words about where we are? Is this, is this the end of the conversation, that it, this is essentially the, the, the consensus, this is the, the agreement? Should we expect some more iterations to come? Um, the language essentially was on nuclear and gas that sort of gave some very specific conditions under which uh, those uh, solutions could be sort of given the, the label. Is this the end or should we be expecting more? Obviously it's a never ending sort of dialogue in Europe, but in terms of this particular act. Well, this particular act should uh, come into force uh, from 1st of January 2023 if we will get support from member states and European Parliament. So they have a right either to reject or then uh, support this act without uh, any amendments. And, uh, and uh, the discussions uh, will, be, uh, will be heated because, well, uh, nuclear is a, um, a topic where member states and politicians do have very um, different views. So we do have member states uh, who have announced that they will uh, close down nuclear power plants. We do have member states who have never built any nuclear power plants at all. And then we have member states who are right now um, um, planning um, new, uh, the build up of new reactors. So uh, uh, lots of, uh, lots of um, 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 discussions in, in this field, but, uh, but based on our treaty, every member state can choose uh, sovereignly their energy mix. And on natural gas, we will promote these investments uh, which help us to phase out coal and replace it uh, with natural gas. So switch from coal to gas actually um, cuts greenhouse gas emissions significantly. And, uh, and um, this was a process uh, that helped us to, uh, to achieve our 2020 targets. Right now, gas is significantly more expensive than locally produced coal. Uh, but, uh, but because in Europe, carbon has a price, then, uh, then overall, this switch uh, should continue to happen um, in the decade to come. No, oh, thank you for that. And I, uh, I have to say, uh, as a, someone who lives in Washington, observing the conversation, sometimes, you know, it looks sometimes messy because democracy is messy. But I always appreciate the search for solution rather than letting the disagreement produce gridlock and no decision. So I appreciate that a lot. Um, 
you've mentioned a few things that I hope we have time to come back on. Um, but let me ask one more thing that was also in the, in the statement yesterday of the, of the council. Uh, and that is the question of ensuring a, a just transition. And I, and I saw that the wording in the, in the statement yesterday also had sort of energy poverty there, which obviously is a, is a, is a, is a topic that is much more acute today with energy prices. Um, from the beginning, the EU Green Deal has had a focus on a, making sure that this is a just transition. Um, maybe let's start there. Where are you in that process? Um, you, you've had a lot of initiatives in specific countries. You've also doing some work outside of the union to help countries implement a just transition. Um, and maybe as you walk us through the agenda, you know, this country is also grappling with some very similar questions uh, with environmental justice and just transition. So if you had a word or two about the transatlantic element of that collaboration, I think uh, our audience would be very interested in that too. Well, yes, we have a strong belief that uh, this uh, transition has to be fair uh, or it doesn't happen. And, uh, and um, we promoted um, the approach that uh, these regions who have worth starting position um, should be um, should be treated fairly and uh, and already two years ago uh, we created just transition mechanism that gives extra support to regions uh, th that are until now dependent on fossil mining activities um, and with this uh, additional financing, we hope that we can replace um, these jobs that will be lost because of uh, mining activity uh, will cease to exist uh, with clean, uh, clean jobs. We all know that uh, uh, renewables will create lots of uh, new job opportunities, but uh, unless we are um, delivering dedicated uh, support to these regions, uh, the new jobs might be created in uh, absolutely different uh, geogra geographical locations. So we don't want to well, uh, end up in the situation where people will lose their jobs and are forced to uh, leave their neighborhood um, to find new jobs somewhere else. Uh, the same principle is uh, important uh, all across the globe. Uh, we do have similar just transition projects um, covering also Western Balkans and uh, Ukraine and and now globally the first uh, big uh, announcement was also um, um, made uh, public during COP26 when, uh, when uh, several uh, major um, uh, um, well several governments announced that they will dedicate uh, more than 8 billion euros uh, to the just transition program in South Africa. So um, this is a, a country which is very dependent on, uh, on coal mining and, uh, and um, who are actually interested to, um, to promote uh, clean alternatives. So, so um, I think that fairness uh, is a uh, principle that we have to well, uh, honor in this regard. No, well, thank you for saying that. And, and South Africa is also a country that we here at CSIS have studied extensively. And so when we saw that announcement at COP, I think it was very much in line with the type of international support that we hope to see for, for South Africa. Um, you mentioned uh, in passing uh, carbon pricing. And, I, you know, we've seen... Uh, you know, for anyone who's been in the energy sector for a while, you know, European carbon prices spent, uh, you know, about a decade at extremely low levels. They were just kind of there in the corner. And over the last sort of, you know, year, year plus, we've seen just an incredible increase in the carbon price in Europe. Um, you know, is that something that worries you or do you see that as part of a necessary component of the market functioning? And what what should we expect on the future of carbon pricing? Obviously, it's one element of a much broader package for Europe in terms of the transition. But what should we be expecting in terms of like the next phases of uh, you know, the ETS and the carbon pricing system in Europe? 
Well, when this uh, system was created uh, in Europe, uh, then uh, the negotiators also um, um, planned a emergency mechanism when prices is uh, increasing very rapidly. And that is uh, happening right now. So I think that yesterday we witnessed another record high price level. And, uh, and of course, uh, several member states, especially the ones who are still using uh, uh, coal, are extremely worried because of this tendency and, um, and um, well, extending this uh, carbon pricing to the buildings and transport sector is uh, under negotiations right now. So um, we have to well um, offer to the industry some predictability, but, uh, but definitely this uh, pricing scheme has been useful to guide industry towards cleaner solutions. And um, well, in the medium and long run, these regions who uh, cover most of their energy consumption with uh, clean alternatives uh, will benefit. Um, on, uh, on carbon pricing, um, despite the fact that, uh, that uh, it has reached uh, record high levels in Europe, um, it has not avoided the situation where um, during this heating season um, we do consume more coal to replace the missing gas flows. And this has been also one of the drivers that, uh, um, that is behind this high um, CO2 um, em emission um, um, level that uh, industry has to buy additional, um, uh, additional quotas because everybody knows that uh, coal uh, emits more uh, CO2 than gas. But unfortunately, this is one of the results how our market reacts to the deficit that, uh, that is there right now uh, in the gas market. No, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we only have a few more minutes to go, uh, but I wanted to see if I could get maybe just a few words on two sort of particular technologies that you've mentioned, if I could get a few more words out of you. One on hydrogen, uh, particularly the sort of rules and codes and, and standards side of things, uh, what the European Union is doing and, and how can collaboration with the United States be enhanced in that area. And the second technology is offshore wind. Uh, this administration has incredibly high ambitions for offshore wind, uh, but the deployment has been much slower than in, in Europe. Um, where do you see areas for possible collaboration on offshore wind in terms of you know, bringing some of the lessons from a region of the world like Europe that has deployed a lot of offshore wind? On the hydrogen side, a little bit more maybe on the standards and, and codes and, and, and technical requirements for this market. I will actually return after two months because we will have business to business event on offshore wind in New Jersey. So uh, this is one of the technologies that, that we are really interested to promote uh, from our perspective. Well, we are negotiating with our member states that they should um, achieve the level of 40% of energy consumption will be covered with renewables. And from where will we get to those renewables? Of course, that is also a problem for permitting in Europe. Uh, we see that, vast, uh, that offshore wind has vast potential. And not only bottom fixed offshore, uh, mm, because we do have sea basins where we do have sh shallow coastal waters, but then we have Atlantic and we have Mediterranean, and there uh, they could use um, alternative uh, solutions like floating offshore, or, uh, or there is a uh, lots of uh, projects ongoing to to get out of uh, piloting phase um, on tidal and wave energy. And, uh, and um, this is, uh, is uh, an interesting work stream uh, um, where Europe still holds the global leadership, but, uh, but we are really interested to share our uh, best practices. And from our side, we will also um, guide our member states how to well, uh, fasten the permitting procedures, because, uh, because if, um, if, if we want to scale up, the production of offshore wind parks. We have to well uh, fasten this uh, this procedure. 
And on hydrogen, well, um, this is not, uh, uh, well, this is emerging uh, market. And, um, and at the same time, we do know that uh, in Europe, industry already, well, needs hydrogen, but 98% uh, of the hydrogen that we consume right now is grey hydrogen, so without any carbon capture, um, not coming from renewables uh, by electrolysis. So we will promote renewable hydrogen, but to replace the grey hydrogen, the fossil hydrogen, we will also uh, uh, need so-called blue hydrogen. Uh, and uh, and um, to en incentivize investments into this sector, we also propose that um, by, uh, well, soon our industry and, uh, and um, some modes of transport should use certain uh, volumes of hydrogen to replace uh, fossil fuels. Well, thank you for those closing comments on hydrogen and offshore wind, two of the most exciting areas where things are happening in both Europe and the United States. Uh, we've come up to our time, and so I just wanted to thank you for, for being here at CSIS and, and having these conversations uh, with us, but also, of course, thank you for your leadership. You know, when I think about what we need to do to meet our climate goals, the US-EU uh, partnership is probably one of the most important in terms of meeting that, that very ambitious agenda. So thank you for all the work that you and your team do in helping us to get there. Um, and with that, uh, thank you very much for tuning in. Until next time.